welcome to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the library entry section of the ACCP community's website. Today we will be talking about tenecteplase for stroke at four and a half to 24 hours with perfusion imaging selection. Our objectives for today are gonna to be to outline the etiology and management of acute ischemic stroke, review previous literature and guidelines for the use of thrombolytic therapy, and then evaluate the use of thrombolytic therapy in acute ischemic stroke up to 24 hours after our last known normal. Acute ischemic stroke is the leading cause of death and disability in the United States. Of all the strokes that occur, there are 87% are cons considered ischemic in nature, with an incidence of around 700,000 people each year. It is considered a medical emergency that's caused by decreased blood flow to the brain and can be classified into various subtypes, including atherosclerosis, cardioembolic, small vessel occlusions, or another determined or undetermined etiology. Rapid re recognition and management are key as time is brain in acute ischemic stroke. The standard of care for acute ischemic stroke within four and a half hours of symptom onset is IV thrombolytics plus or minus endovascular therapy. For mechanical thrombectomy, this has been proven to be beneficial in functional outcomes at 90 days compared to our medication therapy alone. And there have been studies that have shown a better functional outcomes when IV thrombolytic therapy is combined with our endovascular therapy with an increased risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Looking at our 2019 American Heart Association and American Stroke Association guidelines for acute ischemic stroke, our first recommendation is for IV alteplase is recommended in select patients who can be treated within th three, three hours. This is a class one recommendation with the highest level of evidence. Next, they recommend that IV alteplase can be used for select patients treated within three to four and a half hours of symptom onset. Again, a class one recommendation the level of evidence of B for randomized. And then the last recommendation that they have for one of our thrombolytic therapies that we'll talk about today is that it may be reasonable to choose tenecteplase over IV alteplase in patients who are also eligible to undergo mechanical thrombectomy. And we'll talk a little bit about the trials that defined these recommendations. Looking at our thrombolytic agents that are available, for the mechanism of action for thrombolytics is that that thrombolytic is going to bind to our thrombin, activating the conversion of plasminogen to plasma, leading to the degradation of the fibrin clot. We have two different options to utilize for ischemic stroke, alteplase and tenecteplase. Looking at alteplase, our half-life is around five minutes, and therefore it's dosed on a 0.9 milligrams per kilogram basis with 10% being given a bolus over one minute, followed by the remaining 90% of the dose infused over one hour. It is FDA approved for the use in acute ischemic stroke. The next agent is gonna be tenecteplase. It has a much longer half-life of 90 to 130 minutes and therefore is typically dosed as a bolus. Our dose is 0.25 milligrams per kilogram, typically pushed over five seconds. It does have a 15-fold greater fibrin specificity, as well as an 80-fold higher resistance to inactivation by our plasminogen activator inhibitors. Of note, it is not FDA approved for the use in acute ischemic stroke and is utilized off-label. Before diving into some of our trials, let's quickly review some of our measurable outcomes in acute ischemic stroke. The first being our National Institutes of Health Stroke Scale, our NIH Stroke Scale. This is going to be a measure of stroke severity with less than 5, indicating no symptoms or minor stroke, 5 to, 5 to 15 being moderate, 16 to 20 moderate to severe, and greater than 21 indicating a severe stroke. Next, we have the modified Rankin score. This is a measurement of degree of neurologic disability and often is looked at our functional outcome. Um, zero is no residual symptoms, one being no significant disability, two slight disability, three moderate, four moderately severe, and five severe. Of note, for a favorable outcome for most of our trials, they're looking for a modified Rankin score of zero to one or zero to two. Next, we have our expanded thrombolysis and cerebral infarction, or our TIKI score. 
This is going to be a grade of reperfusion, which is the restoration of blood flow to the vessel. Zero being no perfusion, one being antigrade perfusion, 2A reperfusion to less than half of the occluded area, 2B reperfusion of greater than half, and then 3 being complete reperfusion. Next, we have the revised arterial occlusion stroke. This is going to look at our recanalization of the occlusion, which is just the opening of the occluded vessel. Again, zero is going to be where um, it remains the same. One, very slight debulking of the thrombus. Two, a par partial of co or complete recanalization of the main branch. Two, b partial or complete recanalization of the entire area. And then three, being a complete recanalization. Of note, for most of our trials, typically the target is going to be a 2B or greater. Moving into our first trial, so we have the NINES trial in 1995. This is one of our first randomized control trials for all to place in the use of acute ischemic stroke. Um, the median NIH stroke scale of, was 14, and they had to show no evidence of intracranial hemorrhage in order to receive the intervention, which was all to place versus a matching placebo. For our outcomes, there was no difference in our NIH stroke skill improvement at 24 hours, but there was a significant improvement in our modified ranking score at 90 days. This initially was the first trial that showed our improvements in functional outcomes at three months if our thrombolytic was administered within three hours of symptom onset and is one of the strongest pieces of evidence that we have to support that and guideline recommendation for use of thrombolytic therapy within three hours. Moving forward, we have the ECAS-3 trial in 20, 2008. It was a multicenter, randomized, double-blind, parallel group trial with acute ischemic stroke, median NIH stroke scale of 11, set in three to four and a half hours after symptom onset. Again, our intervention was all to place versus a matching placebo. For our outcomes, there was significantly higher favorable outcomes with a modified ranking scale of 0 to 1 at 90 days in our thrombolytic group. They also had better improvement in our NIH stroke scale. However, there was no difference in mortality. And then, of course, as expected, we did see significantly more intracerebral hemorrhage cases in our thrombolytic group. And so this was one of the trials that concluded that there was significant improvement in patients when thrombolytic was administered three to four and a half hours after stroke onset and kind of expanded our time that we typically think of when we use our thrombolytic up to four and a half hours after that onset. Next, we have the wake-up trial in 20, 2018. It was an investigator-initiated, multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled randomized trial the acute ischemic stroke for the median NIH stroke scale of six. And this, for these patients, they had to have a greater than four and a half hour stroke onset, particularly targeting those patients that might be waking up with stroke symptoms. However, they did have to have confirmation for imaging with a mismatched MRI with our diffuse weighted imaging versus our fluid attenuated inversion recovery, which essentially means that it's an estimated usually four to five hours after a stroke onset. For our intervention, it was all to place versus our matching placebo. There was significantly more favorable outcomes of the modified ranking scale at 90 days in our thrombolytic group. There was no significant difference in mortality, and there was no significant difference in our symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage group. However, numerically, our thrombolytics did have slightly higher at 2.4%. The conclusion of this trial showed that thrombolytics in a potentially unknown stroke onset timeframe with that mismatch imaging significantly improved our functional outcomes without that increased risk of death or bleeding compared to our typically within our four and a half hour onset. The next we have was the EXTEND trial in 2019. It was a phase three investigator initiated multi-center randomized placebo control trial, again looking at acute ischemic stroke with a median NIH stroke scale of 11. They did have to be fully functional prior to a stroke, and this looked at thrombolytic use four and a half hours to nine hours after the onset of stroke. The EXTEND trial and the WAKE-UP trial were occurring almost simultaneously. And so for our outcomes for this trial, they may not be powered appropriately. The EXTEND trial was prematurely um, stopped due to the results of the WAKE-UP trial. There was significant improvement in our modified ranking skill at 90 days for a thrombolytic group, and they had significantly higher reperfusion rate as well. 
So while it may not be powered, the conclusions that we do have for the patients included was that thrombolytic use between four and a half to nine hours after stroke onset resulted in numerically better favorable outcomes. And this is a timeline looking at those exact same trials where we went from three hours as our thrombolytic standard increasing to the four and a half hours. Um, and now in the past decade or so, mo moving towards what's the latest time frame that we can include in these thrombolytic patients. There are so many patients that show up to our emergency room who wake up with symptoms and we don't really know their last known onset. And that brings us to our trial today, to neck to place for stroke at four and a half to 24 hours with perfusion imaging selection that was published February 8th, also known as the timeless trial. This was a multi-center, double-blind, randomized placebo-controlled trial with an objective to evaluate the safety and efficacy of tenecteplase administered between four and a half to 24 hours after stroke onset. It included 108 centers in the United States with four centers in Canada between the timeframe of March 2019 to December of 2022. For this intervention, it looked at tenecteplase dosed at 0 0.25 milligrams per kg with a maximum dose of 25 milligrams versus our matching placebo. Patients were included if they had a CT or MRI confirming acute ischemic stroke. The NIH stroke scale score had to be equal to or greater than 5. It had to be an inclusion of the internal carotid artery or the M1 or M2 segment and of the middle cerebral artery, or both, to be our large vessel occlusions. And then there had to be evidence of salvageable brain tissue. Patients were excluded if they were less than 18 years of older or had a pre-stroke functional disability with a modified ranking score of greater than two. For our outcomes, our primary outcome was looking at the modified ranking scale at 90 days. Secondary outcomes included functional independence, which was defined at a modified ranking score of zero to two, recanalization of the implicated vessel, reperfusion at 24 hours, and then reperfusion at the conclusion of our endovascular thrombectomy. For safety outcomes, we looked at mortality at day 30 and day 90, as well as symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage within 36 hours of our intervention. For our statistical analysis, it was estimated a sample size of 456 patients were needed to achieve a 90% power with an estimated withdrawal of 5% of patients. Our efficacy outcomes utilized an intention to treat principle with the primary outcome being based on a proportional odds model with a two-tailed p-value of less than 0.05. Secondary outcomes were analyzed in a hierarchical manner and reported with multiplicity unadjusted confidence intervals. This hierarchical manner indicated that if a primary outcome was not significant, then any secondary outcomes could also not be significant. For our baseline characteristics between the two groups, tenecteplase versus placebo, our median age was around 72 years old, with around 54% of patients being female. The majority of our patients were white at 75%. Our median NIH strict scale score was 12 in both groups. And then for our occlusion site, the most common site was our M1 segment at close to 50% in both groups as well. One thing to point out is going to be our median duration. So time from last well-known to randomization was roughly around 12 to 13 hours between the two groups. Our time from randomization to intervention of the tenecteplase or placebo was very quick at only around less than 15 minutes. And then of note, the time from intervention to arterial puncture for the endovascular thrombectomy was also very short at less than 15 to 20 minutes for these patients. There was an extremely high rate of endovascular thrombectomy performed, close to 77 to 78% of patients receiving a thrombectomy in addition to the intervention. Overall, both groups were relatively well matched. For our primary outcome, it was our median score on the modified ranking scale at 90 days. There was no statistically significant difference with both being in a modified ranking scale of three. This graph below breaks down our each of our modified ranking scale at 90 days. And as you can see in the tenecteplase group, you had numerically more patients who had a modified ranking scale of zero to two. However, there is nothing significant in that. For our secondary outcomes for functional independence at 90 days, again, no statistically significant difference. For recanalization at 24 hours, this did trend Towards the significance in our tenecteplase group, tenecteplase having 77% of patients with recanalization at 24 hours compared to our placebo at 64%. And this was significant. 
Our reperfusion at 24 hours um, was non-significant, both groups being around 57%, in addition to our reperfusion at conclusion of endovascular thrombectomy being non-significant as well. For our safety outcomes with mortality within 30 days and 90 days, there was no difference between the two. For our symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage within 36 hours, there was not a, did not appear to be a statistically significant difference. There was 3.2% in our tenecteplase group compared to 2.3% in our placebo group. And of note, this is on the 3.2% with our tenecteplase group is on par with our percentage associated with intracranial hemorrhage post thrombolytic use in some of our other trials as well. And then for parenchymal hematoma within 72 hours, very few patients developed this and there was no big difference between the two groups either. Looking at the discussion portion and for our strengths and limitations, some of the strengths of this trial was that it was a randomized double-blind trial that was placebo-controlled with a multi-center recruitment. Both of our comparator groups were extremely well-matched at baseline, and there were trained assessors of the outcomes that were unaware of our treatment groups to limit the bias between these groups and these results. For our limitations, this study did only include those with large vessel occlusions, which are often more likely to be candidates for endovascular thrombectomies already. So it did limit a proportion of those patients who might have other types of strokes. It also had a very limited population that received our intervention at a primary stroke center. So majority of our patients actually ended up being transferred to a comprehensive stroke center for that endovascular therapy. Only 3.5% of patients received the intervention at a primary stroke center, which could have delayed the time in which our intervention and randomization occurred. And then there was a high rate of endovascular therapy and thrombectomies performed in these patients, which is anticipated given up to 24 hours and with our large vessel occlusion based on our guidelines. However, this could have also skewed some of our results really looking at the thrombolytic efficacy. In conclusion, the timeless trial did not show a significant improvement in functional outcomes at 90 days with the use of tenecteplase four and a half to 24 hours after our last known well. This was the first study showing that IV thrombolytics did not necessarily increase our rates of intracranial hemorrhage when given up to 24 hours after a stroke onset, which is important to note. However, additional research is needed to truly determine the role of thrombolytics up to 24 hours after stroke onset in patients who do not receive endovascular therapy. While we didn't see a significant improvement, we also did not see a significant increase in harm with our bleeding rates for the use of thrombolytics up to up to 24 hours. And I will take any questions that you may have. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club Presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of these journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.